Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou School Boys Varsity Tennis Team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, welcoming adversities, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is the highly respected president and CEO of the Avalon Group. She is Christine Kemp, and today we are going beyond real estate. Hey, Christine, welcome back to Beyond the Lines. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Honored to be here again. Christine, you are doing so many incredible things. You have done so many, and you continue to do that. But can I first ask you, what's a memory, early memory that you had growing up in Korea? Early memory that I have growing up in Korea was that it was um, cold. Um, I woke up and walked in the snow with my bare foot. I was three years old, and I remember that we were very poor. So up on the rooftop, that's where we kept all our food refrigerated because we didn't have a refrigerator. And I remember walking on the snow, touching all the little pots where we kept the kimchi and the pickled vegetables and the food. And I still remember it every time it snows. We, go, we just came back from skiing. And that's an early memory. Wow. And Christine, I, I want to ask you this because you're, I mean, your family, I mean, your husband, your son, Ethan, I mean, you're so successful professionally. And then how do you balance family versus work? Well, if people say they're balanced everywhere, they're lying, especially the more successful you are, you have to look at the family makeup and the support system. And my husband is a very supportive husband who helps, uh, you know, do grocery shopping, who helps with uh, picking up my son. I have a whole network of um, you know, extended family who help with my son. I only have one son, so you know, it it takes maybe less of a balancing than somebody who might have multiple children. But overall, overriding theme is that my husband and I are a team, and we raise our son together. Well, you guys make an incredible team, and your son Ethan. I know him. He he's an incredible boy. I mean. Love Ethan. I mean, he's on the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team now, carrying on our tradition. Oh, yes. <laughs> he's so proud to have made it in his freshman year. He aspires to do to be you, you know, play <laughs> tennis all his life. <laughs> Man, that I feel so flattered there, Christine. And Christine, I, I want to ask you, why why did you start the Avalon group? Well, I've always remembered my uh, my dream. And my dream was to make a difference and land, land um, you know, working in development or you're changing the landscape of communities, you can truly make a difference. So first 15 years of my career, I worked for others to learn the, the trade and understand it. And as I, I, I quit in the 14 years and nine months into, the, into, into my career, I realized that it was time for me to start my own company. And I focused on projects that really were filling the gaps in the community. Because to me, that is what's rewarding. And, and I, you're, Christine, I, you're, you're doing that just because you have such a passion to really help local families and local businesses, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, in a community, somebody who was raised, and first of all, being an immigrant coming to Hawaii, the opportunities that this community has given me, I love this country, and I especially love Hawaii. I know it, it sounds very, you know, Pollyanna-ish, if you will, but I absolutely believe it. So I, wherever I go, I want to make it better. And um, so my focus in the so 24 years in the business, we're, we're going into our 25th year now. And so 24, 24 years since I started my company, I focused primarily in the west part of Oahu. Why did I do that? I didn't build housing. I built places of business because I felt that the gaps in that community was places to work, economic opportunities so that they didn't have to drive into town. 
So in 21 years since we first made our investment on the west side, we built 19 projects, all of them commercial. Man, that's impressive, Christine. And Christine, can you share with our viewers some of the properties that you've developed uh, in the past? Thank you. So as I just mentioned, you know, Kapolei Business Park, um, 171 acres is what we've invested in. Um, Milltown Business Park, Coral Creek Business Park, all these business parks, right? Places of commerce. But we also looked at opportunities such as Hawaii Kai. You know, Hawaii Kai has the highest concentration of home ownership. But on the flip side, what is very unfortunate is that there's very few rental opportunities because everybody owns their ho own homes. And people who want to rent, they, they don't have the opportunity to move there. And because of the highest concentration of home ownership, the schools are one of the best school districts in the state. They have IB, uh, International Baccalaureate Programming from kindergarten all the way to Kaiser High School. And I knew this. And having gone to public schools myself, I felt that I needed to find rental housing opportunities for Hawaii Kai. And we built 7,000 Hawaii Kai. And from that, we also built affordable housing for families, two and three bedroom units for $1,500 to you know, $2,600, unheard of. And so we were able to deliver affordable housing and gap market housing for people, prices that our average income earners could, could afford. So um, I'm very proud of it. I won the developer of the year for Hawaii Kai because it's such a difficult place to bring new project. You know, I stepped over, stepped into the project after four failures on the same site. Four developers failed and could not make it work. And we made it work and we were able to de deliver housing there. So that was um, uh, 7,000 Hawaii Kai, which I still own the affordable housing component because I had promised that it would be affordable for the durations that we've committed to. So we'll be keeping that in affordable for quite some time. Man, I, I love hearing all the developments that you've done. I mean, so successful and just the impact that you're making in our community is, is priceless. And Christine, can you share with us the current projects that you're working on? Oh, yes. <laughs> we have um, four projects on the west side. We have one project in Manoa and three projects uh, in downtown Honolulu. So Davies Pacific Center, we've acquired it. It's a high rise, 375,000 square feet, 20 stories, 23 stories tall. We're converting that to 352 condominium units uh, called Modea. We also acquired half of a block next to Walmart. We call it the Shark Campus. It's bordered by Hotel Street, Fourth Street Mall, and Bethel Street. And we're in construction right now for the Hawaii Pacific University's um, Science Center. And so that is expected to be completed in August. So you'll see 5,000 students back in uh, on Fourth Street. They're moving back from the Windward side, where Hawaii Loa College used to be. They're coming back to downtown. And that's because we're building this building for them. Um, and next to it, we just acquired Walmart building, as you know, um, and we're very pleased. We feel that that can be the center of downtown where we can do some significant activities to bring people back to downtown. And that's so exciting, Christine. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, three blocks in downtown. And that's so necessary. I mean, it, it's, I mean, downtown needs, needs more of your developments for sure. And, and Christine, tell me about the, you acquired the St. Francis School property as well? Yes, so 11.2 acres of um, land. Uh, the St. Francis School closed four years ago, unfortunately. And um, the nuns of St. Francis, this was the only asset they had. And most of them were in their 70s to 80s. They needed to sell it for a certain price. And we felt that we could actually bring money back to them so they could retire for the rest of their lives. So it wasn't a market deal. We overpaid for the property, but we believe that we have a plan to bring about affordable housing and market housing in that property. Oh, I have no doubt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Manoa hasn't had a, a new project in over 20, 30 years. And so we're, we're going to make it so that there's a mix of affordable and market, similar to what we did in Waikai um, in that property site. 
Christine, can you share a bit about the challenges that you deal with when you're maybe taking over a, a business building and trying to turn that into a housing residential? Yeah, so there's been a lot written about it since we've acquired uh, the Davies Pacific Center. Um, we are trying to follow the International Building Code, but City and County has something called a housing code that's in direct conflict with what everyone else does um, in the rest of the nation and internationally as well. And that is converting office buildings um, into residences require in Honolulu um, windows for every bedroom. Every living space needs a certain amount of windows. And that would make us, force us to build significantly large units. And, um, and that would mean that it would be unaffordable to most of us. You know, it would run into a million to $2 million for regular homes that we'll be building. So we tried to change the code to be recognizing what Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, major cities who have high rises that are vacant have already adopted the International Building Code. The state of Hawaii has adopted it. But city and county of Honolulu, while they adopted it, has this archaic law called the housing code that didn't recognize. It was in conflict. So we've been trying to change it. We've uh, met some resistance because of misinformation, but this, the legislature has stepped in this year and is working on um, a law that will recognize this. And we look forward to that. Wow. I mean, that's <laughs> Hawaii yeah. needs to keep up with, with what's going on. I mean, just the times are changing and people, I mean, all of us, in order to be successful leaders, we have to adapt and adjust, but a lot of these ancient laws have to be updated as well. And Well, they have to recognize, recognize the technologies and the design principles that have changed. I mean, you know, no one is going to put everybody, anybody in the harm's way, right? It's about life safety. It's about, you know, uh, quality of life. And, you know, no one wants to give that up. And for us, we're spending $100, $250 million into this investment. We wouldn't do anything that the market wouldn't accept. You wouldn't buy a unit without any, you know, proper ventilation and proper windows. We know that. But the city has been very cautious, and, and it's not the city leadership. It's been just, you know, the council as well as the staff. They are just trying to do the right thing, but are not properly informed. And so um, we are, you know, I think the legislature body has now recognized that technology has changed, design principles have changed, um, and the vacant office buildings, if we don't do anything, we're going to come into some significantly trouble downtown. And to save downtown, we need this law. Oh, definitely. Christine, I want to ask you about my books. You you have both of my books. Um, you and Ethan both have my books. And <laughs> yes. How how do you, how did you like the books and what are some concepts that stood out to you in it? I love your book because it's a very easy to read and it's applicable in every instance. It's right? not just business, but in your coaching, it's the winning mentality. I love that. Um, the particular thing that really resonated with me is because it's the you know embracing adversity, welcoming adversity. You need to be able to welcome that that mindset of saying you know no matter what happens let it come and deal with it and and the way you wrote it it was easy even for my 15 year old to understand but for me that principle has guided me for the for all of my adult life and that is why i feel that i've reached the level of success you can't win unless you uh, you know you welcome adversity and i call it um you know embracing your fears and stepping into it and if you're if you're governed by your fears you'll never achieve anything. If you're governed by um, you know, avoiding adversity, you'll never reach the greatest height that you can be, you, you can possibly be, right? So um, I, I love that concept. Embrace oh. the adversity, welcoming adversity. I love that you mentioned that. And because Christine, as, as we both know, I mean, adversities are inevitable. And so it's, it's all about tr training the mindset to welcome it so when it does happen we can deal with it and move on and actually become better for that experience so that's why that's what that concept really is that welcoming adversity and christine i i have my third book superior and mm -hmm. um in superior i talk about the difference between a culture of excellence versus a superior culture of excellence and 
a gigantic difference between attention to details versus superior discipline details. And you and I have heard the term high achievers before, and I'm inventing the term superior achievers in this book because you're not a high achiever, Christine. You're a superior achiever. <laughs> and for you to achieve the success that you've had and to be sustaining the success and really growing your company, that's why there's that difference between what I say, going from good to great to superior. What are your thoughts about that? I couldn't agree with you more. Um, the discipline that's needed to be um, a superior achiever, attention to detail, it's all the important aspects of achieving uh, the best. You know, it, it just reminds me, superior um, achievement. I remember when I first started with my first job, my boss used to um, tell me, is that the best you could do? I'll finish the work and give it back to him. And he said, is this the best you can do? And I'll look at it and say, hmm, no, let me come back to you. And I'll fix it, fix it, fix it, and come back. And I'll, he'll say, is this the best you can do? And I'll say, oh, no, no, let me look at it again. I don't know. Did I miss something? And I would do that over and over again. And, and, and I would come back with this superior work problem. Right. And, you know, in hindsight, as I got older, I read, I read a concept. It was actually a psychological concept people use. He was using psychological warfare on me to be the best that I could be. But absolutely, that mentality that he set me, set me right for the rest of my career. Man, I love, I love that story right <laughs> there. That's so smart of your boss to do that yeah. because... I mean, all of us, we're all capable of doing so much more than we think we're capable of doing, right? We have to push. In fact, we're building Dream House High School for um, a school. It's a charter school. So it's not a private school, but, you know, they have a thousand kids who sign up to get the one class, like a hundred spots. And it's heartbreaking to see them, you know, not getting the spot. And I asked, I asked the school administrators, what is it about your school that makes everybody want to be a part? And, and how do you get such high achieving kids? Do you handpick and cherry pick? And says, no, it's by lottery. It's by lottery. And yet they achieve far greater. And I asked them, what was the difference? And when they said, it's, it's the expectation that they would be high achieving. Right? It's the expectation that's given to every child when they come in. You're expected to, in your words, I guess, superiorly achieve. So that to me is exactly what people need. They need to hear, you need to be a superior achiever. And so for that particular school, they're achieving beyond their, their expectations. These are kids from why not? These are kids from you know, uh, uh, places where they can't afford to have the transportation to, to, to get to the school. And yet they're achieving such high levels of scholastic achievement. I'm so proud of them. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to build for them, even though they didn't have the financial um, you know, background or what have you, we decided to dig in. We're going to help these kids achieve the best that they can be. Man, that is impressive, Christine. And Christine, you are such a highly respected leader. How would you describe your leadership style? I am a doer, right? And I significantly look at the responsibility of leadership in this way. I must take risks in, in a way that will be responsible for my investors, my staff, my family, and my community. And um, what I mean by that is I embrace my fear and I expect others to embrace their fears. I, um, so I lead by example and I expect them to do the same as I do. I would never ask someone to do something that I wouldn't do myself. That's my I, style of leadership. I love that. And Christine, you have built such an incredible team around you. I mean, because um, we all know that Everything starts with the leader, but you can't do it alone. It, it takes a team effort. Tell me about the importance of your team and teamwork in general. I ask my team to have an owner's mentality, that they do 
as if they were doing for them their own business, their own family, their own assets. You know, when um, so the decisions have to make common sense. Decisions have to be worthwhile, and um, you know, so the everyone kind of buys in. They have to have ownership in the game. They have to have what they call this. I always say skin in the game. You gotta have a skin in the game. And the skin in the game a lot of times is the incentive compensation that we provide. But I've already identified top leaders in my organization. I've decided that they will own the company with me, not buy it, but they're going to own it. Whatever they do will be the company that they inherit when I retire. And I actually gave them my exact date of retirement. And I've identified the four leaders. We were looking for maybe a fifth leader to lead in for every division that we have. But um, the way I look at it is I can't achieve everything by myself. I have to have people who act as owners of the business and make decisions similarly. And therefore, I've made them owners. They're the future owners of this business. They all have it. And I, I, I think they all now bought into that. So they act like business owners, even though they don't quite own the business because they know it's going to be their business. Wow. That, Avon that's a... Group, yeah. I could have named Avalon Group Camp Development Company, but I didn't. I named it Avalon Group because I've always known that this business belongs to people who earn it. So my son Ethan will not be inheriting my business. It will be given to the staff who have built my business with me. Wow. <laughs> Christine, that's, that's wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just at a certain point, how much can you take with you? Yeah. And the best thing that ever happened to me is the fact that I had to earn my living and I had to earn everything that I've given that was given to me because it gave me courage, um, that allowed me to have my own leadership style. And I would like my son to go through and become himself. So the best I could do is to pay for the best education that he can get into, um, and get the best uh, type of you know skill sets like tennis. Uh, so that that we can provide him. So we're providing that um, opportunity. But my son knows. We always talk about this. He will find his own path. Yeah, no, that's so important. And, and Christine, I, I love your mindset and, and the reasons why you do what you do. And just the legacy, like you just said, that you want to leave to your team members there. And they're a reflection of you. You're a reflection of them, obviously. And Christine, I want to ask you the importance of communication because all successful teams have to have great communication. And for me, I would always share with my team that I wouldn't give good feedback or bad feedback. I would give honest feedback. What are your thoughts about that? So, in fact, the new supervisors that um, who become who take on the role, you know, um, one of the most difficult thing for them is to give honest feedback, constructive criticism. And I all I told them the leadership is not a popularity contest. Leadership is a responsibility, and you have to muster up the courage to say what is needed, needed to be said, because you're not doing anyone any favors. And therefore, that communication is important for feedback. And we don't wait for an annual assessment or a quarterly assessment. We give feedback when we see it, when there's a need. The adjustment has to be made immediately. Um, so, uh, you know, the reason why you're such a successful coach was that you are able to give the feedback. It wasn't a popularity contest because sometimes you give feedback that they don't want to hear. Um, and I think, you know, as leaders, we have to learn how to give the medicine. And, you know, for those who want to be led and to learn to be a leader, they have to learn how to take the medicine because it's all good for all of us. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, some people... They can't handle the truth, but if they know that you're trying to help them and they they know that you have empathy for them, then the trust and respect builds and then they can start to handle the truth, right? Yeah, well said. I agree. <laughs> now, Christine, it's yeah. hard to achieve success, but it's even harder to sustain success. Um, what are you doing? Because you've obviously achieved great success and now you're at that level where you're trying to sustain success. What are you doing to, to assure that Avalon Group will be in business forever? 
Well, uh, succession planning, which I've already done. I've done that five years ago. So we're five, five years into my 15 year plan. So I think um, it's absolutely important. The second part is making sure that everyone is on the same path, eyes on the ball. So um, not only just sharing feedback about performance, but I share with people about what's going on in the company. There isn't anyone who doesn't, it's, it's very transparent. Transparency is very, very important. Why are we doing what we're doing? What is it that we're it's accomplishing uh, for the company? And what is it, how does it mean for, for that particular person, the team member? What, it, what does it mean to me? Why do I have to do what you're asking me to do? And we have to be able to be transparent about that. So transparency is very important. Um, and then uh, when I, you know, as a leader, I also have to reassess the amount of commitment that I'm making to the organization. Most recently, I've decided that I'm giving up my board positions in uh, many of the boards that I've been on for certain ones, YMCA, and I stepped down in Kahala Nui Senior Housing, um, and, and I now recently resigned from Central Pacific Bank. These are all efforts to ensure that we're focused, because I mean, we've never done this many projects at once. But we also didn't have the number of team members and the high caliber of people who have all the experiences we need. But given the amount of complexity that we're facing, I wanted to make sure as a leader, eyes on the ball, even for me, and I needed to make sure that everyone knew focus, discipline, focus, execution. We need it. And so um, I'm doing it by example, and I'm asking that of everyone in my team. Christine. Uh, you're you're focused on Oahu. Um, are you are you considering expanding to really help uh, some of the outer islands as well? Oh, uh, we are. We actually do have um, three prop, actually four properties on Maui on the west side. So we are waiting for you know the permitting issues to resolve all the cleanup, and then we'll we'll start to look at redeveloping on on in Kanapali and and um, Front Street. In Lahaina, we have a couple of properties there too, a couple of properties in Kanapali. So we will be looking at that, but right now, Maui's um, need a lot of help. And uh, I sit on a couple of committees where we are evaluating the rebuild efforts. Um, Kauai, we actually own over 30 acres in Kauai, and we are looking at opportunities. Um, I think for Kauai, it's infrastructure. So hopefully we can elevate the dialogue to get the right infrastructure to build more housing there. Christine, it was an absolute pleasure having you back on the show again today. And, and I have to say that I want more Christine Camps in the world. And I want to thank you for taking time to join us on the show today. It's been an honor. And thank you, Rusty, for um, inviting me back. Really a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Christine. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com, and my books are available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. I hope that Christine and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.